Good morning, everyone. Uh, we would like to start. Uh, may I please invite those sitting behind to sit? It's, it's, it's supposed to be a round table, so we are supposed to see each other and contribute in a multi-stakeholder way in, um, in a way that is equal to everybody. So we don't want anyone to sit behind. Please join uh, because there are, there are more seats um, that need to be filled. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for, for being obedient. Uh, I think we should just start um, so that uh, we, I, I know when civil society sits together, we usually have um, a very, sometimes you have very heated conversation and sometimes we want enough time. So I need your guidance. Do we need to introduce ourselves just to know who is here quickly? Um, I think I think because we are not too many, we can do that very quickly. So we can start from the very end. Uh, just your name and maybe the organization and the country. Now it is. Now it is. Uh, yes, my name is Jonathan Zook. I'm with the Innovators Network Foundation, uh, and I work on issues related to the future of work. Um, and I'm also part of the at-large community uh, in, uh, inside ICANN. Uh, I'm Chen Peng from China, and now I'm working as the representative of ISOC Taipei chapter. Hi, I'm Heidi Lo Giles. I'm working with Tor, and I'm developing partnership within Europe. Hello, Sebastien Bachelet from France. I am... Uh, a chapter member of uh, Internet Society and involved in at large uh, in Europe and beekeeper. Hi, I'm Roger Dingledine from the Tor Project. We write privacy software to keep people safer on the internet. I'm from the US. Hi, I'm Satish Babu. I'm part of uh, the ICANN at large and also the Dot Asia board. Hi, Moira Whalen from the National Democratic Institute based in Washington, D.C. Hi, I'm Elena Hickok from the Global Network Initiative, and I'm based in the Bay Area. Hi, I'm Konstantinos Komaitis. I'm a non-resident fellow with the Tech and, uh, Democracy and Tech Initiative at the Atlantic Council, and I'm based in Geneva. Hi, everyone. Ali Funk with Freedom House, based in New York. Hi, everyone. Jem Brody, also with Freedom House, based in Washington, D.C. Hi, everyone. My name is Abul Hassan Sise from Mali. Uh, my organization is Smart e River. Uh, and I'm Grace Gidega from Kenya, Kicktonet. Hi, I'm Luke from NetMission.Asia, and I'll be your rapporteur for today. I'm Chris Painter. I'm the president of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. It's a global capacity, cyber capacity building organization based in The Hague, but I'm in the U.S. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Nick Benequista at the Center for International Media Assistance at the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington, D.C. Hi, I'm Anna Kampanek from the Center for International Private Enterprise, also in Washington, D.C. Hi, my name is Daniel O'Malley from the Center for International Media Assistance in Washington, D.C., and I'm also the co-chair of the Dynamic Coalition on the Sustainability of Media and News Journalism. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I came from Bangladesh. I work with an organization called ActionAid, and mainly by focusing on the young people and the civil society networks. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Nisha. I'm from Women in Tech Maldives. Hi everyone. I'm Mir Mohammed Nahidul Hassan from BGD Gopsart, Bangladesh. Good morning everyone. Uh, I'm Ifran. I'm a law professor from Bangladesh. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, this is Gopal Krishna Kimere. Uh, President Paul Bar Association. Okay. 
good morning everyone i'm reza from bangladesh i'm an independent academic activist hello guus van zwol dutch ministry of foreign affairs just listening in i'm mayor walters from the us department of state i'm also just listening in Hi everyone, my name is Maria de Brasdefer and I'm from IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, based in The Hague. Hello, my name is Jean-François Bambel, I'm come from Congo Brazzaville. Uh, Kenneth Merrill, uh, National Telecommunications and Information Administration um, at the US Department of Commerce, and just listening in today. Hello everyone, my name is Giovanni Zagni, European Digital Media Observatory, uh, just listening in today. Eileen Donahoe, US Government Special Envoy for Digital Freedom. Florian Martin Baritou uh, from Canada, Law Professor at the University of Ottawa and Director of the Center for Law, Technology and Society. I'm Wolfgang Kleinwächter, retired professor from the University of Aarhus. Hi, Randy Michelle, Director of Technology and Democracy from the White House, also just listening in today. All right. All right. I think um, I think we have uh, we have uh, everyone um, identifying themselves. Uh, so I'll like, uh, I want to welcome you to this um, uh, breakout group, uh, specifically for civil society on the declaration for the future of the internet um, and uh, i don't know how many of you have engaged with the with the with the declaration but uh, it reasserts a shared vision of the global internet as a platform for openness and innovation while promoting uh, and protecting human rights. I think uh, the element of human rights here comes very strongly. The um, Declaration on the Future of Internet Principles commits partner countries to protect human rights and fundamental freedoms of all people, uh, promote a global internet that advances the free flow of information, advance inclusive and affordable connectivity so that all people can benefit from the digital economy, promote trust in the global digital ecosystem, including through protection of privacy and protecting and strengthening the multi-stakeholder approach to governance that keeps the internet running for the benefit of all. Now, just looking at a few uh, of, of, of people we have interacted with in this room. Uh, I see many friends, I see colleagues that we have both interacted at ICANN level and at IGF level. And I think some of these, uh, some of these principles have been um, an issue of concern, especially the issue of human rights and how the internet needs to protect uh, human rights of users. So I think um, I am just thinking that uh, the declaration um, you know, is, is, is sort of futuristic and has taken into consideration some of these conversations. And so it will be interesting to hear from civil society. So we are going to have this discussion along, along key thematic areas. So there is the issue of uh, priorities. Um, you know, for example, which um, uh, Declaration on the Future of Internet principle is a top priority for you as civil society and most ripe for action by the multi-stakeholder community. Then we also have uh, cooperation. You know, we've been talking about, uh, oh, Ken, where are you? I don't know how to do this. Um, we've been talking about uh, the need to speak, uh, the need to focus on, on, on uh, cooperation with governments and with uh, other civil society, I, I mean with other stakeholders. So how, you know, the second theme will be on cooperation modalities. And we want to hear how can governments work with multi-stakeholder community to operationalize the declaration on future of internet principles and how can DFID signatories facilitate open transparent dialogue uh, and a venue for candid discussions on operationalization of the DFI principles and how can stakeholders uh, leverage uh, the principles to spur governments to act in support of 
uh, the principles. And then I think we'll also need to look into, you know, time allowing, uh, how do we, how will we define success in realizing the vision, and then what obstacles do we see standing in the way? So at this point, I, I would like to just field the first question. Um, in your opinion, which declaration of, of, the, of the future of internet principle is a top priority and most ripe for action by the multi-stakeholder community? And we've just gone through uh, the principles. The first one is protect human rights and the fundamental freedoms of all people. Second, promote a global internet that advances the free flow of information. Third, advance inclusive and affordable connectivity so that all people can benefit from the digital economy. And fourth, promote trust in the global digital ecosystem, including through protection of privacy and finally protecting and strengthening the multi-stakeholder approach to governance that keeps the internet running for the benefit of all. Who wants to give it a shot? Uh, yes, Jonathan Zook again. I, I, I guess the first thing that jumps to mind for me is uh, the multi-stakeholder model. I, I, f I feel as though um, uh, the multi uh, civil society and, and business need to re-engage with government and, and kind of um, work together because I, th I feel like governments now are feeling like multi-stakeholderism is too slow or, or is bogged down and, and as a result are taking actions that are kind of incompatible uh, with each other and, and, and leading to a fragmentation. And, and so that relates to the other principle of well, is of free flow of information, et cetera, that uh, is, is another principle. And I think that, uh, I, I think reestablishing the multi-stakeholder model and, and reaffirming its importance has got to be uh, a critical uh, step for us because I think right now the governments are sort of at the, at the point of creating this fragmentation we're trying to avoid. Uh, I'm Satish from India. Uh, two quick points. First is that for me, uh, trust, access and trust have to go hand in hand uh, so that uh, the digital divide is conquered and also uh, we have a trustworthy internet, which is very important. Second. Uh, I am a little surprised that my own country has, has not been a signatory, and I wonder what we should do to socialize uh, the declaration among countries so that there is more widespread adoption and signatories. Thanks. Roger Dingledine, Tor. Uh, so all of these sound awesome. I'd love to have a world where everybody agreed with all of these. Uh, I'm a little bit worried about interpretations of them. So this trust one that you were talking about, uh, we're talking about promoting trust in the global uh, and including through protection of privacy, that sounds great. But if I were a government, uh, I would be looking at this and saying, oh, trust, and then I'd be thinking misinformation, and then it's a slippery slope down to censoring where Europe, for example, wanted to block RT.com on the uh, claim that it was misinformation, and, and they say we're promoting trust by preventing you from reaching that website. So I, I, I love the, the, the goals that I think we mean here, but I wonder how to make them more robust so that when uh, Russia or Hungary or whoever uh, signs on to this and then they use it as, as the reason for why they uh, need to constrain the internet. What happens then? Would you, would you have a suggestion on how to make them robust? Because, um, um, you know, I am sure you do know in, in, in theories of participation, we always say that uh, solutions are with the people who raise the issues. So what would you be suggesting? This is my first IGF. Um, I'm going to pause before, uh, before suggesting more. 
Okay, but you shouldn't be afraid. The IGF is the platform that allows you to articulate your thoughts in a very honest way uh, so that then it goes into guiding and shaping uh, policies thereafter. Yeah. There was an, yeah, there were two hands. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. So actually, I wanted to uh, reinforce the discussion on the access. You know, there are in the in terms of the uh, the global south where we are sitting in, we see a lot of digital divide. You know, so in in terms of the urban and rural, you know, division, and also you know there are many other kind of divisions and distinctions in terms of um, facilities, infrastructure, and also literacy aspect is very important. So. Um, you know, trust is important, everything is important, but if we don't have that access, if we don't have these facilities where we're sitting in, so then all this, you know, discussions actually not be materialized at the end of the day. Thank you very much. Um, my colleague from Bangladesh over here touched upon the point that I wanted to iterate to. Uh, being from a highly dispersed nation with, you know, small islands, um, Access to internet is not something that every island has or every person in every island has. So I feel like that should be a point for discussion too. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, there seems to be some sort of, um, um, so of course there's the issue that has been raised about uh, the multi-stakeholder model and the fact that uh, civil society and businesses need to re-engage. Um, there's the issue of interpretation that is on, on principle uh, number, number four on the issue of trust. How do you translate this trust? How do you ensure that there is no misinterpretation uh, to allow for countering of that internet? And then, of course, um, there is the, that other issue of access uh, and connectivity. So I think uh, our rapporteur is noting that, and uh, uh, and, and some of you know some of uh, I think it would be interesting to hear, especially on the issue of trust, how we can strengthen that because trust is critical. Really, it's critical in even in even if we we look into multi stakeholderism we still need to go back to the issue of trust. How do we trust all stakeholders to actually uh, bring on their opinions onto the table and to respect each other because I think there has been that issue. Um, the issue of access for many countries, especially third world countries, um, you know, developing countries, uh, we really haven't, uh, say for example, gotten there. And so there's still that element of being at a basic uh, in, in terms of access. So we already have those three as, as a priority, I guess, for, for this group. And uh, I'll now suggest we move on to the... Could, could I chime in? Okay. Really quick, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, from a conceptual perspective, I struggle to distinguish between the different principles um, because to me it seems as if, for example, the multi-stakeholder internet governance is a process by which to achieve some of these other goals. Um, so I find it challenging to try to make a hierarchical approach to them. If I were to have to choose, um, I would just wanna raise the first one of protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms because I think um, a global internet helps achieve the protection of human rights and also if you, if a government is, or other actors, or we're talking about the private sector as well, um, also abides by that first principle, then you're gonna have more trust built into the digital ecosystem. And same thing as a multi-stakeholder process can help better protect rights. Um, so just wanted to make that point and the conceptual concern I have of trying to break these apart. Okay, uh, there are more comments coming. Um, I don't know if we have uh, one of the volunteers just to help us take, oh, there she is. Uh, and then we are coming back to you, sorry. Yeah, yeah thanks. I, I think that's an excellent point. Part of this is which of these things leads to the others, uh, I think is an important part of this conversation. And, and I think we should take note of the fact that we sort of arbitrarily decided to get into breakout rooms 
um, based on civil society, government, et cetera, in, in what is meant to be a multi-stakeholder um, uh, uh, meeting. And so, I mean, I, I think that, uh, again, I, I think that uh, we talk about sort of thinking globally but acting locally, and I, I feel like access, while it may be the most critical issue in many respects, is, is the one that's most difficult to solve at, a, at an international level. And I don't know uh, the right way to approach that. It feels very much like a, uh, a local or national problem uh, from a solution standpoint, even though it's a global, a global problem. But uh, I, I, I'm a very much take your point that we ought to look at what are the building blocks for the others. And, and again, I think getting us uh, mixed more in with the other stakeholders might be the first step uh, to accomplishing some of the other objectives. The gentleman next to you. Thank you. Um, a few points. The first one, it's um, a lot of things you say, it's uh, very often now done by private company. Access to internet, for example. In Ukraine now, it's, uh, uh, um, it's uh, satellites who give uh, the access. And uh, um, we have to be very careful with that uh, because at the end of the day, those company, large company, large groups will decide what is good and what is not good for us. Government, it's already difficult to trust them, but those uh, private companies, it's worse. Therefore, we have to take care of that. The other point is that um, when we talk about uh, multi-stakeholder, I would like very much that we add the S at the end of model, because there is no one model of internet governance. There are models, or there are different way of doing um, um, multi-stakeholder. If at the end of the day, every organization do the same, uh, the diversity will be lost and uh, we will um, jeopardize the multi-stakeholder um, way of doing things uh, altogether. And, 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 and the last point is that we are looking to the future, but what is happening now, just a few days ago in France, they, put a, or they would like to put a law where everybody needs to be recognized when you are in a social network. Therefore, where, where is the human rights, where is the um, a possibility to talk and so on. Uh, if, if everybody needs to have uh, their own identity, uh, no by everybody, and especially by the police in our government, uh, uh, democratic, so-called democratic government countries. Thank you. Okay, there's a gentleman behind. Uh, I, I don't know if I got you right about the multi-stakeholder model and everybody doing the same thing. That was not clear for me. If you talk about multi-stakeholder model, I think you are already saying something. It's multi-stakeholder model, z, z, because I hope that not each organization will do exactly the same. If not, at the end of the day, we can merge those organizations. We don't need the differences. It's why I think it's important to, to remember that there is no one model fits all. Hi, I'm Reza. Uh, very quick, I think in institutional fragmentation uh, is, is the key here, what probably we are discussing, because in my understanding, even the global norms um, and also treaties and organizations all are actually having a, some uh, institutional fragmentation. And that's probably a lead to us to have this, some forms of study on the also global internet framework uh, and global internet governance issues as well. Because this is, I think, almost all the sector we are struggling with this whole particular conceptual understanding on this institutional fragmentation. Okay, I think uh, our rapporteur has noted uh, has noted quite a number of uh, of points there, um, quite some good points. Uh, we'll be reporting them back in the plenary. So at this point, I would suggest we move on to the next question, and it's on looking at uh, uh, cooperation modalities. Um, and the first issue we can discuss now is how can governments work with the multi-stakeholder community to operationalize 
um, the DFI principles. Um, and then, of course, how can DFI uh, signatories facilitate open? We've been told in the main, uh, in the plenary, how can DFI signatories facilitate open, transparent dialogue and a, ve and a venue for candid discussions on operationalization of the DFI principles? I think the issue of uh, trans, you know, uh, candid operation, operationalization has come out even in our first uh, discussion. And then how can stakeholders leverage uh, the DFI to spur governments to act in support of the DFI principles? And um, I suggest you can just pick on any area that you want to comment on. And, uh, oh, you already have the microphone. Okay, all right, <laughs> uh, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, well, one thing is obviously uh, settings like this are really good to get input and to carry forward th some things, but I think what's often missed is trying to mainstream these principles in other venues that are not necessarily about uh, internet freedom or human rights. This, this forum is great for that, the IGF, but there are many uh, forums that are dedicated to, say, um, uh, cybersecurity, other issues, um, two of us were recently at a big conference in Las Vegas that was uh, uh, the DEF CON conference, for instance. There are, uh, my organization is having a big capacity building summit in Ghana at the end of November. I think it's important to mainstream these principles in those conversations too because often the stakeholders are different depending on which of these different venues you go to. And sometimes the stakeholders are the same and talk to each other, but often they're different communities. And the same with governments often. The different people in the governments deal with certain different issues. So I think the more you can make this, not just conversations here, but conversations in those other discussions, I think that will help uh, further these efforts so people take these into account, use them, when they're doing policy in other areas as well. And there are stakeholder groups and interaction in each of those other areas too. Again, sometimes the same and sometimes different. Hi, this is Daniel Maley from SEMA. You know, I think, uh, you know, one of the questions here is, uh, you know, I also have concerns about the fragmentation of these uh, governance processes. And, um, and you know, governments kind of can start different initiatives and there can be kind of a lack of understanding of where people should go and what is the most important. With that in mind, I think one thing that governments can do to help facilitate to make sure that this is inclusive is that we need to understand that different stakeholders have different amounts of power, different uh, abilities to participate in all of these. You know, I, I agree with the, the gentleman who just spoke. So I think it might behoove governments, given that they have a lot of power in this space, to help civil society support that engagement, um, because I think that's going to add legitimacy and a lot more value to this process. Yeah, and you 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 make you you actually make a point about governments because and and, and also the issue that he has raised about uh, mainstreaming these conversations in different in different forums because I think, yeah, we are sitting here during the IGF and we want to have very honest conversations that then influence and shape policy. But uh, when you go into cybersecurity circles, um, you know, governments are there and they want to take uh, a key lead and even take control um, and sometimes uh, look at it as a security issue as opposed to looking at it as a multi-stakeholder issue. So, you know, completely agree with the two of you. Next, yeah. So, yes, thank you again. Um, so my discussion is, you know, how this discussion is also be part of other international mechanisms. Let's say um, how we are reaching out to the governments, uh, so those who are, haven't still uh, connected with this whole uh, mechanism. Let's say my, my friend from the industry says it's not with signature, so, I, I imagine Bangladesh is not the same. Bangladesh is the same, probably. So, um, uh, so uh, you know, nationalization of this uh, this discussion is also important, uh, and localization. So, you know, there are other discussion uh, under the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, how this discussion is also being aligned with this, uh, you know, uh, Sustainable Development Goal SDGs, and also you know, um, other. Uh, uh, pertinent issues of human rights globally under the UN system and beyond. So that is important. So if we cannot discuss from the 
a local to national and bringing the nationals your know, national governments under the platform that would be difficult you know to you know Im implement this principle that we are discussing over here so and uh, so as the multi stakeholder mechanism so yes thank you very much again so thank you yeah and I guess, uh, again, you know, the IGF does that a lot. We discuss issues from a global perspective. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, stakeholders are also supposed to take the conversations at national level. Uh, and especially uh, if you, you, you want to change things at national level, then those conversations must also happen there before you can bring them up. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I want to stay, Moira Whalen, I'm with the National Democratic Institute. I want to stay with the government's uh, point for just a moment that uh, previous uh, speakers have, have raised and make sure that we don't use the term governments uh, as a monolith. And recognize the need to look at parliaments, look at electoral management bodies, look at oversight of fiscal structures, judiciary structures, as an important component for the outreach of this work when we're talking about the DFI, because that's really what we're talking about is a sustained model. And all of those entities need to have a sustained conversation and engagement with civil society. Um, I also want to make uh, just one quick point on, you know, many of us in the room spent yesterday talking about the feminism in the global digital compact and just the concept that um, an inclusive approach, and it is mentioned in the DFI, also puts the burden on governments to have more conversations than just simply one consultation with broad civil society, but recognizing the various interests. And, and uh, I appreciate the effort by the US government to sort of outline that in the consultations document that, that they shared but that this isn't a box checking exercise in terms of consultations. This is true engagement. It's engagement at, uh, with many different stakeholders and with many entities uh, of the government. We tend to concentrate on the executive branch, but um, that's to the detriment of the overall multi-stakeholder system. And we've seen that in the result of shrinking parliaments, closing spaces. Um, that civil society is not making best use of, of those opportunities to help strengthen those systems. Uh, I think that's a strong point about civil society. Uh, um, you know, not, not um, using the opportunities to strengthen the processes. And I think uh, if there's anything that we need to take from, from here, as civil society players is that that we still need to play a major role in strengthening, in helping bring out what are the issues, uh, and in making sure that they are brought onto the onto the onto the documentation that is there. Yeah. Speaking of governments not being monoliths, uh, one of the the conflicts that many governments have, we have the human rights oriented pieces of government here, but there's also the national security or law enforcement or intelligence, uh, people trying to, uh, let us say, undermine human rights. And uh, there's, a, there's a natural alignment between the pieces of government we're talking about here and civil society, where we, we care about these principles that we're talking about. So in terms of how to implement this, uh, stronger collaboration between the pieces of government who want this and the civil society groups in each of these countries. Uh, and I'm not just talking about funding, I'm talking about uh, putting the people who are experts in the right situations to, to argue uh, on behalf of, uh, of human rights. And because, I mean, it, in a lot of, I can look at the US as an example, and we've got a lot of different groups uh, and moving pieces in the US, but there are a lot of different countries out there that, uh, that aren't uh, maybe as far al along at, uh, at making that interaction and collaboration work. Great. Um, uh, very good points that are coming out here um, in this. Uh, again, I think this is something that has been argued um, and, and maybe also needs to be um, as, as the declaration here, yeah, we are saying it's the future, um, that need to bring on, um, you know, subject matter experts into, into discussions. 
despite the fact of, you know, whether their background is civil society or technical, but, you know, to be able to shape uh, in these conversations. Um, is that all? I don't know, you've been very quiet. Sorry to pick you out. I mean, I guess the only thing I would add is that from my perspective, it's important to think about the implementation of the DFI and how it's going to um, influence other processes that are happening at the global level, other visions that are being created. I think we're really at a point of a fragmentation of the vision of the internet, and that is very concerning. Um, and so I think principles like multi-stakeholder, like protection of human rights are key and it's great that it's in the DFI. Um, my question um, for governments and for civil society is how do we actually make sure that these influence perhaps other competing visions that are emerging? Okay, go on. Thanks. Uh, uh, very quickly, um, and it really goes back to both what Ellen and I and Moira were sort of saying, I think we also need to do a much better job at, well, governments need to do a much better job at including civil society at a national level, and especially when they're legislating and they're doing indigent policy. Currently, I am in a region where uh, Europe, that is, that is producing, you know, vast um, internet legislation, and we're seeing in many, many cases that there are significant issues that challenge the principles of the DFI, um, but, and when civil society speaks up, they are actually not being heard. So we really need to do a much better job, and this is a not meeting at the IGFs or in other international meetings. Governments need to do a much better job at integrating civil society in the decision-making process, uh, and by that I don't necessarily mean that civil society needs to be able to make laws, but they need to be able and be in the position of holding governments accountable when they're passing laws that are against the DFI principles. And that will require um, reimagining those processes that currently they are very used to uh, are applying when they're lawmaking. Yeah, I think you make a good point, considering that, uh, you know, I, and I think it's the nature of the internet that it's uh, very dynamic and uh, governments are consistently feeling like they need to respond with laws on, uh, on uh, emerging tech and uh, emerging behavior. So, for example, the example we've been given of France, where, um, you know, they want everybody to, to be identified on social media. And I don't know how realistic that is or how practical that is, but I think there's a human rights component because uh, what if you don't want to be identified and you just want a space to communicate? Do you have that right to do that? And I think uh, you raise a good point because as civil society, civil society is known to, to, to ensure that governments are being accountable, but I think there's, there's a challenge that's being seen in, in this sector where, for example, now governments are starting to become very powerful and civil society. I don't know whether it has complied or it's, you know, through complicit that it's not coming out as strong as it's expected. So I, I know uh, that Ken and uh, the, the others who, who really have been working hard to ensure that the DFI uh, are put into use are listening to all those concerns. Yes. Okay. And then we'll come back to you. Yeah, he has the microphone. Oh. So, I, yes, I think <coughs> two, three things, uh, as, as um, our earlier speaker said. I mean, as you know, in Bangladesh case, in Bangladesh are all Southeast Asia and South Asia cases. The new laws are coming, and the old laws, like when earlier in 2000, 2000 around 2000, uh, when the laws are were implemented, that those laws are amended, or even coming up with a new new liberal legality, they're coming up new institutional framework and new laws. At this stage, I think for in Asia specifically, if I can say, then probably implementation part, national human rights commissions or commissions, whoever actually establish in our jurisdictions like law commissions, uh, National Human Rights Commission, or even uh, 
some forms of uh, PVC commission so, so in some countries. So over there, if we can go and interact and engage and do advocacy work, probably this is the one way to get in because the old or senior generation rights activists, in, especially in Asia, are not necessarily interested much on this internet freedom issue or, or, or internet related digital rights issues. So then there is a essential need probably to have a interaction and intersectionality discussion more in our context. So then probably there is a chances uh, <coughs> to have better understanding because in my understanding, the all, all old or or even rule of law principles are heavily, heavily actually attacked uh, through these new legislations which are about to deal with the cyberspace these days. Okay, uh, pass on the microphone to him. The gentleman here. Thanks, Satish from India. So I have two points. The first point is that uh, when you talk about multi-stakeholderism down to the national levels, uh, there is a dearth of multi-stakeholder structures in many parts of the world. Some parts have it. Europe has it. Maybe Brazil has it. But many other countries don't have it. So there's a question of, there's a vacuum there, and what fills that vacuum? What I would say is that the national IGFs are already multi-stakeholder. They can play a very constructive role in advancing these principles at the national level in places where there is no such multi-stakeholder structure. So the national IGFs have a special role there. Secondly, when the security apparatus talks about national security trumping everything else, what do we as civil society have? I think we should project the global public interest as the countervailing uh, influence when the national security people talk about national security trumping everything else. Thank you. Um, again, uh, good points, and I think very succinct points uh, that are coming out of that discussion. Um, at this point, uh, it's 10.33. Uh, we are still on time. Uh, and I would suggest we move on to, the, to our third um, uh, theme, which is on measuring success. And uh, we have two questions here. So how would you define success in realizing um, the DFI's vision? And secondly, what obstacles stand in the way of realizing the DFI's principles? So this is also our time to contribute. Uh, one on, 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 on um, if you were told to look at the principles now and say how would they look to, you know, if you want to say that they are successful, how would that success look for you? And then, um, you know, because we've been talking, so what are we saying about the obstacles? What's in that success, then what obstacles stand in the way uh, of ensuring that we have that success of the DFI principles? Uh, I think you haven't contributed, so we start and we go round. Uh, yeah. Thank you, yeah, I think um, picking up on what a colleague had mentioned, I think a major ob obstacle that stands in the way of seeing this come to fruition is that civil society has very limited bandwidth and there's so many different fora mm -hmm. and processes in which to engage. There's DFI, FOC, Summit for Democracy, Global Digital Compact. We don't have a lot of time and so we're, you know, we can feel a bit scattered so it would be helpful you know, if governments collaborate um, you know, to help guide or like hear out civil society on where we think the needle could really move to help us kind of hone in on one outcome. Okay. I might just make that call more direct. We need funding to do this work, um, <laughs> to be just quite <laughs> blunt. Uh, like you said, there's just so many different spaces that we want to plug into, and in order to do that meaningfully, we need staff on teams to do that, um, especially for, um, organizations in the global majority that are so often left out of these conversations. I think another challenge 
is just how to think about integrating or um, pushing through the DFI and the geopolitical world that we're in right now. It, it, in my opinion, it takes talking about human rights and the global, the importance of a global and interoperable internet in a way that is talking about how it impacts national security and economic incentives. So learning how to speak the speak that talk and coming from a democracy organization that is something that we also are working on as well but i think that is going to be key on incentivizing certain governments that the human rights argument just might not bring them in yeah um and very quickly i think we need to empower both the dfi and the communities that are using it to be able and actually use the text because currently it is a text that it's really nice to read and it's out there but it doesn't really have any legs so I need we need to figure out how we can take those principles and when we a civil society for instance speaks up and refers to those principles then you know we don't need to justify further why we're referring to those principles if you know what I mean so empowering both the declaration and its principles but also the groups that are using it I think will be a good step forward so that, that for you that is what success would look like yes that uh, when we, when the principles or there are suggestions that we don't have to really justify, right? Uh, yeah, because people have thought about the process and they have discussed and they have actually come finally to the conclusion that this is good. Yeah, the declaration is there, right? We yeah, have, yeah. We don't need to go back to the text all the time, but how can we use the text in a way that, you know, it, it makes, it le legitimizes <coughs> without having to argue about it. Right. Sorry. Good. <laughs> yeah, thank um, you. I would just add to that, you know, find ways for governments to use the principles and hold them accountable to the principles in both their domestic and their foreign policy. I think sometimes it's very easy from a foreign policy perspective to commit to these things, but at the domestic level when we're talking about cybersecurity law, you know, uh, platform regulation, surveillance, it's a very different picture, um, so, yeah. That was very similar to what I was going to say, which is about harmonizing this, right? There needs to be an understanding that if governments are signing on to this, that they have committed to all aspects of this. And what instead we find is that one section of the government will have signed on to it, but that that is not harmonized throughout the rest of their foreign policy. And this is especially a message for countries that are signatories to DFI that are also donor countries. We see very much in civil society that those are not, they have not spoken with other parts. This also goes to the issue of national security where you will see uh, cyber resilience or e-governance, for instance, models that don't include a civil society engagement. Uh, component and a co-design and an equity by design component to that work um, and I should say this is not limited to one government it is it is fairly evident across all of the donor nations so I think an obligation that governments need to understand that is on signing on that uh, on to the DFI they are going to create mechanisms that are then transparent about how they are going to harmonize this and how they are going to be accountable to it uh, would be a useful tool. Um, I think it, especially with big donor governments, you don't get there overnight, uh, certainly, but a mechanism that demonstrates there's a path to getting there. Um, I, I really like that point about uh, uh, the co commitment bit, um, and especially, uh, you know, when, when there are especially discussions on cybersecurity that touch uh, on security because I have noticed that uh, when it comes to that, then civil society is left behind because this is seen as a national, I mean as a national security issue or a state security issue or you know government issues and governments must sit together to just discuss cyber security and yet the perpetrators happen to be ordinary citizens out here, yeah. Yeah, so success to me as civil society would be constructive dialogue within all the stakeholders. Let me give an example. Uh, my country, India, is known for its internet shutdowns. These are unilateral. There's no consultation. We don't know when it's going to end. So uh, success in this case would be when civil society is called into a consultation to discuss the problem and how we can solve this, maybe complete shutdown, maybe graded shutdown, maybe for some time. All these options are there, but they only come out with this consultation. 
So constructive consultation would be a success uh, evidence as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Uh, constructive, um, you can still have constructive dialogue, but it leads nowhere. <laughs> yeah, because we have seen where, uh, you know, governments just call, um, you know, like, like for example, I'll talk about, you know, my government, we have, we actually, um, public participation in, uh, in public policy is entrenched in the constitution. But uh, it still is, in some areas, it's just been to tick a box. So you have very constructive dialogue, but it doesn't lead to really like outcome that you'd expect. Yeah, so um, if it, you- It doesn't uh, construct anything. <laughs> Correct. So, uh, you know, when we're ending here, I, I think uh, we'll ask Ken to provide uh, probably an email where when you have already thought through, for example, what does, what, how would we define a constructive dialogue? It would be important to, for, for you know, to receive that so that it's better understood. Yeah. Yes, you have the microphone. Uh, yes, thanks, Jonathan Zook again. Um, I, there's an old saying that what gets measured gets done, and uh, uh, one of the things you're talking about is how to define success and how to measure success. And it could very well be that coming up with some objective measures of success as part of the DFI effort should be one, one of our objectives, is building into it some objective measures that have to do with internet fragmentation, that have to do with uh, censorship. Because I, I feel like all the things that we're putting out there as measures of success are fairly abstract right now. And it'd be very easy to say, well, we, as you said, we held a constructive dialogue and everything like that. But maybe we ought to be trying to get down to brass tacks to figure out uh, measurable um, it, uh, statistics about internet openness and said, I know that there are already some agencies attempting to do that, um, but maybe we should make that part of the DFI commitment mm -hmm. because then countries have something against which to be held accountable instead of just a set of abstract principles. Mm -hmm. Good point there. Um, anyone else? Uh, the micro, okay. And then you'll, you'll bring it back to the lady here. Okay, and I'd then like we'll come to you. I'd like to uh, briefly double down on this harmonizing thing that we were talking about where uh, the US signed this and yet inside the US we're still arguing about how encryption is scary and maybe nobody should have it. Did England sign this with their recent laws undermining human rights and so on? Like, yeah, so what, what's going on there with the, 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 d the different pieces of the government? And the answer is the governments are not a monolith. But that, that seems by far the biggest barrier to me, which we've got some pieces of government saying, yeah, this is important. And as you were saying, especially it's important for other countries to have it. And then how do they reconcile that inside? Yeah. I, I think that's a very important point about uh, that governments are not monolith because we have seen, and again, I go back to the issue of cybersecurity. We have seen different arms uh, coming up with different laws and yet they're in the same country. So the need for harmonization is critical and it goes down, it boils down to multi-stakeholderism. Yes, please go on. Well, and let's make very clear the why for that because I think governments need to hear that from civil society, that it's not just good to do, but that when you look at countries that very probably will never sign on to the DFI, um, that inconsistency is exactly the vulnerability that is identified in the overall system. So the, the very weakness of signing on to a document and not fulfilling it on the back end demonstrates an overall weakness of the approach. And so that needs to be a very clear message to governments that if they want to strengthen this approach, if they want to really help the multi-stakeholder system, that synchronization uh, is is what's going to win the day. And, and uh, I'm just looking at Ali with the Freedom House report from last year, right? That identified that in very clear terms, in measurable terms, that the multi-stakeholder framework consistently applied is what increased the, the freedom ranking um, of countries that did rise on, on the index. But taking words out of your mouth. <laughs> I think she needed to speak. 
No, just picking up on the thread about um, accountability, like thinking about a tangible product, like a report card <laughs> of sorts to like call out like the inconsistencies, the lack of synchronization would be like a very tangible outcome that could be a measure of success and something that demonstrates accountability. Okay. Oh, I keep forgetting you. No, I'm, I'm, you. I'm so sorry. I'm no, so sorry. Uh, Please go on. Uh, let me recall my name. My name is Nazmul from Bangladesh, so so that you would don't forget again. Um, the thing is that, you know, uh, <laughs> so, you know, uh, the success criteria should be, you know, again, I would, I would uh, emphasize on um, how more and more national governments are respecting, uh, protecting, and fulfilling the commitments that are being placed and trained in the declaration. At the same time, I would say, uh, uh, probably in, in, in many cases, the technology transfer could be a vital issue to the Global South. I think the, for, the, for the most marginalized communities, how they have the access um, and, and they meet, you know, minimize the uh, divide um, and also uh, when you are talking about multi uh, uh, engagements, I would also focusing on that how these are being localized, um, not only you know nationalized. Sometimes, all, sometimes you know in the capital trap, um, probably in this uh, discussion in the city, but how it is being also going down uh, to the far uh, beyond the capital. So that is also could be the success criteria of all these principle and uh, discussions. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe our rapporteur, you can tell us where where things are at. Uh, are you are you good? Okay. Um, and uh, so, just to help again, like we have said, to help uh, in strengthening this. So, one of the things that uh, we are going to suggest is that. Uh, if you have any suggestions that you think uh, would help in um, either strengthening the DFI, um, you know, we'll provide, uh, you, you can make suggestions and send those as either an individual or an organization. But um, just, just to wind up this discussion, um, you know, to what extent, if any, have you, any of you in this room, engaged with the DFI partner countries on uh, programmatic uh, areas and priorities. Um, just hold on. In programmatic priorities that align with the DFI principles, and if so, how? And it sounds like um, you might have done that. Yeah, the NDI lady. <laughs> I'm very bad with names, but I... Please pass on the microphone. Um, I, I think I'll, yeah, let me just, uh, let me just, uh, yeah, let me, let me repeat the question. To what extent, if any, have you engaged with the DFI partner countries on programmatic priorities that align with the DFI principles? If so, how and what? There we go. Um, NDI does actively, I should say, engage with governments around the world. We're present in about 50 countries. Um, engagement on these sorts of concepts and principles is consistent not only for us, but for my colleagues who are also here uh, for the uh, from the uh, National Endowment for Democracy family, as well as others around the table. That being said, I will say, and I, I can only speak for myself, um, having done this work, when we uh, work with other entities, such as election management bodies, political parties, parliaments, um, there is, I have never heard of the DFI referenced as a, a concept. Um, they are somewhat familiar with concepts contained in the DFI um, and working towards that is a work in progress and a, a core part of our work. But uh, the, the DFI as an existing structure um, is, is not in my experience mobilizing parts of government outside of perhaps the ones that signed it, which traditionally our organization would not work directly with uh, for instance, a foreign ministry. 
um, or an executive office, we would more likely engage with the parliamentary and okay. civil society in a, okay. in a country. Okay. But that's, that's why I'm saying where it's, it's where we touch. It's not to say that it doesn't exist. Okay. Um, it's where the organization as a body would engage. All right. Uh, anyone else? I know the, for me, the first time I heard about the DFI was last year. And at that point, I thought maybe they were just a draft. Um, so you make a good point because uh, I think uh, those, you know, the the countries that are supporting that need to hear this from civil society because in this room sits a very strong civil society advocates that uh, can actually help bring this out with the rest of the community. Um, yes, yes, yeah. Daniel. Yes, this is uh, Daniel O'Malley from SEMA. And uh, just to echo what Moira was saying, you know, we engage uh, with stakeholders from the around the world on news media issues, also through the um, Dynamic Coalition for the Sustainability of News Media. And I can say that um, I haven't ever heard anyone from civil society talk about the Declaration for the Future of the Internet. Like you, I kind of learned more about it at, at last IGF and then found out that it still existed at this IGF. So, you know, there's clearly government uh, initiative to, to keep pushing it forward, but it hasn't really engaged in the same way that I think some other processes like the Global Digital Compact that the UN has led, where we have seen a lot of engagement and, and, and interest. Um, so I think that is a challenge. I think it's a challenge when we're thinking about uh, the impact, because if, when it's, it's hard for civil society to think about that, given that this is a government-led process. Civil society wasn't calling for a declaration of the future of the internet because we're already engaged in other processes that were ongoing. And so then one more thing gets slapped down and it's kind of thinking about how do you renegotiate your workflow to try and address this new issue. Um, I think in terms of looking at, um, I think accountability is a really important thing to think about. I think the other challenge is that we want to make sure that we don't have internet fragmentation. So how do we go about accountability, making sure that governments that are not monoliths are aligning to these values without creating uh, a splinter net and without creating kind of a geopolitical divide in terms of the signatories of DFI and those who are not signatories of the DFI. I think that will be something that's really important for kind of the communities at least that we work with. The lady. Hi, yeah, Nisha from Maldives. Um, so as you said, like, today was the first time I heard of the DFI. And uh, while sitting here, I had looked up the signatories on the list and was quite amazed to find out that Maldives is on the list. <laughs> but uh, we have never heard of it. I mean, there have never been any discussions about it in the Maldives. So I guess that actually highlights that there is a you know, a kind of a discommunication or a discontent between the government and the civil society. And that's something that I feel like is something that we have to go back home and address. So I just wanted to highlight it as a point that we are on the list, but we've never heard of it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I think let's pass on the microphone too. <laughs> That's interesting because, um, you know, you, you, your government has actually, um, you know, uh, supports, but uh, the players are yet to hear about it. So I think it's something that you have to take up. And uh, in terms of strengthening and in terms of the success of the DFI, that there needs now, what is the next step in terms of engagement, in terms of creating awareness, in terms of getting um, players to use the DFI and to articulate its values the prin and the principles. So I just feel like for the final conversation, I want to pull on this thread because you're a lot of you are hitting the same thing. I just want to ask Misha, did you say you're from government or civil society? You're civil society. Um, so you said you've never heard of it in civil society in the Maldives. Moira, you started with engagement with many governments, including in the DFI never heard it referenced. Daniel, you've also said never heard it referenced in your outreach to civil society around the world. And I want to bring this all back, because I think this is, could be one of the big themes for civil society when we regroup. Constantinos, you talked 
earlier about the what what would be success for you would be if the DFI itself had more validity and solidity as a point of reference in the international community. Not that this you know civil society necessarily wants it to be its own thing, entity, secretariat going forward, but that the principles themselves don't have to be re-articulated, renegotiated, et cetera. They have a solidity, like, you know, Universal Declaration or something, for the internet. Um, and that is not there yet. And I think this is a point, this is something we all have to work on. How do we get there? Because there, the processes now, I would say the conversation that I've heard, dec uh, the Global Digital Compact, I actually think there would be a little bit more of an open door there to do that. But we've got to take a leap in solidifying the DFI itself before that really happens. So maybe that's an opportunity for civil society. Use the principles in all of your, you know, input to the to the global digital compact so that the UN itself uses it as a point of reference. You may be leading the governments and then give this feedback to the governments that they themselves are not using it. They're, you know, they did this work and they're sort of letting it go off into the ether and nobody's saying you have to bring it around the world and have a lot of meetings and, you know, and compete with the FOC or compete with other processes, but the principles um, are very useful and can save time. So I think just pull on that thread a little bit. Um, yeah, um, it, it, that's a good response. And I think uh, uh, there have been engagements uh, on the Global Digital Compact. Um, different, at different uh, levels, you know, regions. Um, but I think what we are saying is that DFI principles have not been as vocal as that, and it's time. We are saying they're a good thing, so how do we then start using them? Uh, how do we strengthen them so that they become, um, you know, they, they, they help us in these processes? Strangely, those other processes don't want to compete with the DFI as a separate initiative. And there, I think as the DFI was getting launched, there was a little bit of concern that nobody wanted, you know, proliferation of venues and, you know, nobody can do everything. But that's why making clear there isn't an effort to create a separate entity. This is your gr principled ground that you bring everywhere. And so that even in the Global Digital Compact, they don't need to reinvent the wheel on these topics. And, and help them let down their guard that this is proliferation competing with them. Instead, it is so solid, valid principles feeding in. So they don't have to do the same work. Okay, that's noted. Um, so we have um, one minute to 11. I would like to, for, you know, we are reconvening, I think at uh, 11.30, uh, it would be nice for people to have a coffee break. So I am giving this opportunity to anyone with closing remarks. Um, I don't know if Ken is here. Yeah, um, I think you need to just say something before uh, we can give um, an opportunity to somebody who wants to give us closing remarks. There is a microphone. <laughs> okay, sorry. I don't know, does anyone have any closing remarks? Um, otherwise, I mean, I think we can give folks time to get back to the main room and grab a coffee, as Jake said. Okay, I had expected that you'd be guiding us on, say, if people have comments on where to send or... Uh, I'm sorry, say again? Yeah, I was hoping that uh, if anyone has a comment that they might have, you know, people are thinking and th they will continue processing the yeah. information. So if they want to make input, where do they share that information? Oh, of course. Um, yeah, so, you know, we, uh, as Grace mentioned earlier, um, you know, I, I, we've, we do 
intend to keep this conversation going. Um, uh, and so, you know, we, we will certainly be following up with, um, there'll be a, a, a report out. Um, uh, in the next se session, we're going to be sort of pulling some of the key themes that have emerged across the breakout rooms um, that our repertoires have, have uh, collected and um, sort of seeing how those, um, what's emerged across the different breakout groups. Um, and then coming together as a multi-stakeholder community um, uh, to, to discuss those. So um, yeah, I think, I mean, that, that's the plan for the rest of the day. Um, and uh, it was just, I, I think that this group in particular, uh, I was you know, really pleased to, to hear um, some great feedback in this group. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll hand the ba mic back over to Grace. Okay, uh, thanks, Ken. So I want to thank every, um, all of you for very grateful um, suggestions, uh, very uh, great input, and for being very active participants. So let's continue um, getting aware, you know. Let's um, just understand what the principles are and how they can impact our work and how we can. Um, I, I hope, Ken, that all the conversations and the uh, recommendations that have come in to strengthen uh, the principles then will be taken on board. And um, once they're done, we don't even need, they don't need to compete with anyone because it will be automatic for them to be quoted in all the other processes. So thank you very much, and um, we reconvene uh, in the main hall at 11.30.